Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the museum. Um, there are a few points that you need to remember. So, before you go in, I'll just run through them. Then you can all go off and have a good time. So, first of all, you've all paid and you all have a ticket that allows you to go anywhere in the museum and includes one trip to the 3D cinema. So, you need to make sure that you put the ticket somewhere that is secure but easy to find. This is partly because you'll need to show it to our staff if you decide to go out at any time. There are two restaurants which are outdoors, for example, and um, anyone who does decide to go outside should go and come back through the grey gates. Please don't use the emergency exits unless there really is an emergency. Now, I'm afraid that if you want to take photographs, you have to purchase a permit at the entrance. We don't allow visitors to take photographs of anything in the museum unless they have a permit. If you'd like a picture of you and your friends at any time, just let us know. We have a number of professional photographers who will take a photo for you. Um, another thing is that you must keep everything that belongs to you with you all the time. A lot of people will come to the museum during the day. You'll probably be here for most of the day yourselves, so don't lose your wallet. And make sure you don't leave your mobile phone anywhere. It's easily done and we aren't responsible for any losses while you're here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can go and see any of the films that are on in the 3D cinema. I'll tell you about those in a minute. Uh, there's also a schedule on the back of the museum guide. I suggest you get to the cinema entrance roughly five minutes early. It takes very little time to seat everyone, so you won't be waiting for the show to begin. Well, I think those are all the instructions I need to give you. Are there any... Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK. The films which are on today are being shown at different times. They're also about some amazing subjects. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. The first one is called The Secrets of the Nile and starts in half an hour at 10 o'clock. It's a beautiful film and it tells the story of the journey that was made down the River Nile for the very first time, starting in the mountains of Ethiopia and passing through the Sudan and Egypt before reaching the Mediterranean Sea. You'll accompany the travellers as they explore some of Africa's truly amazing landscapes. The second film moves off land and into the sea. It's called Wild Ocean and this one begins at 11.45. So you have some time to look round the museum first if you choose this title. In this film, you'll join the huge number of fish and other animals that live far down near the bottom of the sea. 
You'll see them search for food, migrate and fight for survival. <laughs> Dinosaurs Alive is the third film showing today. It starts at 1.45pm and runs for just 30 minutes. This is a film for people who like special effects because there are plenty of them. Scientists now have a lot of evidence to show that some animals from the dinosaur family are still living on Earth. So in this film, you'll live with a new species of dinosaur that has been recreated using computers. <laughs> Our final film today is simply titled Arabia. It starts at 2.30 and is a little longer than the others, but it's a really wonderful experience. You'll ride through the desert on a camel. You'll also dive among the treasures of the Red Sea, where you'll explore the ruins of an amazing lost city. Sounds great. <laughs> well, these are all magical experiences, so I'll let you decide what you want to see. If anyone has any questions at all... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a talk by a security worker from Sydney Airport who is introducing the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2, so can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though. He'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. 
and despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learnt about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers and the package itself is returned to the sender or passenger if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears. We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between 2 and 10 days within the item's scheduled arrival date. OK, before we move on, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation in a continuing education institute's office. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Holtz. Hello, Jeremy. I was told to come to this office and ask about your continuing education program. I'm interested in taking classes and want to know more about the program. Certainly. We have several different programs depending on your education goals and on what you are doing now. For example, we have continuing education programs for those who want to finish a degree or start a new one, and we also have a program for working adults. Well, I'm working part-time now, and I'm interested in completing a degree in business administration. I am working at a hospital, you see, but I want to change my job, either work in hospital management or have my own business. Okay, that sounds great. Many students in our program want to advance in their current careers or even change them. What kind of degree do you have now? I am a registered nurse with a two-year degree. Great. First, we have to figure out where you want to take classes. We have satellite campuses all over the region. The ones at the city centre are accessible by public transportation but offer fewer course times. A car is the best way to attend classes at our satellite campuses in the suburbs, but they have more classrooms and therefore more courses. Well, I have been saving up for a car, but I don't have enough money to buy one yet. I think the city centre campus will be better. OK. Now we have to decide which program you want to register for. We have night courses, where the classes generally run from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Classes during these hours are usually once a week. There are also courses during the day that might work for you, depending on your work schedule. Well, like I said, I'm working part-time and unfortunately I work during the evenings. You see, I'm living at my parents' house right now. My father is quite ill, actually, and since my mother works normal hours, I take care of him during the day and my mom takes care of him in the evening when I work. The city center campus doesn't offer classes during the weekends? No, the suburban one does, but unfortunately, there are no classes during that time at the city center campus. You know, maybe the online courses will be better for you. Do you have access to the internet? Yes, I have a computer at home. That might be the best way for you then. It's still a new program. We're still working out the bugs, but it will allow you to work part-time, take care of your father, and take classes. The completion of your degree will probably take longer, however. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, how exactly does this work? I'm slightly nervous about studying again. It's been years since I've been a student. Yes, it can be a bit daunting at times. Continuing your education and improving yourself are well worth the effort. Actually, before you start taking online classes, there are several refresher courses that you are required to take. What kind of courses are those? These are especially made for the returning adult student. We understand that education is just one of a number of priorities for those that take classes with us. The refresher courses teach you how to manage time and juggle between different areas in your life. Techniques like writing down your daily schedule and ways to avoid procrastinating are talked about. Also, there is one course that reviews basic study skills, like the most efficient way to read the course text as well as basic academic writing. I think that would be really helpful for me. I enjoyed studying when I was going to school, but I definitely need some tips on how to manage my classes along with the rest of my life. Many students I've seen are in a similar position. They have to balance both their work and family life with their education. It's not easy, but it is very rewarding for the ones that finish their education all the way through. OK, so how do I register for the classes? You need to go online to do that. I will give you a brochure with the appropriate web address. You can choose which course modules to take online. You can go through them as time allows. There is even a place to keep track of progress towards your degree. All right. Can I ask then about the cost of the online courses? 
They are cheaper than classes at either campus, of course. Online, you'll see a number of different ways to pay. You can pay up front for each course module you take, or pay over a number of months. The latter method of payment will probably be better for me. Are the textbooks and other course materials expensive? No, not at all, actually. With all online courses, the relevant materials are included free of charge. They are available to download after you register. That sounds great. Thank you so much. No problem. My contact information is also in the brochure. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about how to choose flooring materials. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We've been talking about choosing building materials in the last week. Now, a great many factors influence the choice of building materials. You can't make a house of cards, right? And people who live in glass houses and all that. Anyhow, today I'd like to say a few words about flooring. Some artificial materials can be used, like plastic for instance, which offer mixed blessings when used as a flooring surface. On the one hand, plastic is cheaper than nearly any other alternative, short of bare ground. Plastic also does not warp like wood. On the other hand, the best that can be said about plastic is that it looks like wood or stone. However, it cannot replace the real materials. As I have mentioned, I'm fixing up a new house. The decorator my wife hired told me plastic does a great job of looking exactly like plastic. Besides, it scratches easily, fades or discolours, and starts cracking within a year or two. So if you're fitting out a sleazy hotel or plan to live in a trailer park, go with the plastic. Really though, for all intents and purposes, this leaves us with wood or stone as choices for flooring. Stone and wood are alike in at least one respect. Both go through processing before they can be put to use. Since few of us cut our own lumber or quarry our own stone, this is not perhaps a pressing concern. Still, do-it-yourselfers would do well to remember to buy only properly seasoned wood. Unseasoned wood warps, and a warped floor quickly becomes firewood, and its owner quickly becomes poorer. Likewise, except for dull-hued materials like slate or sandstone, most stone floors are polished before installation. The choice goes well beyond just wood or stone. Each type requires many further considerations. A few special remarks are called for when considering wood. For example, as always, aesthetics, personal taste and layout all play roles, as well as the type of house or room. Oh, and certainly don't forget the cost. When it comes to cost, a rule of thumb is that the softer and less exotic the wood, the lower the cost. In the US, for instance, pine is both ubiquitous and cheap. Mahogany is imported and exorbitantly expensive. If you're on any kind of budget when remodelling, it's really helpful to remember to go for the softer woods. Aside from cost, there are still lots of different factors that are important in choosing the best flooring for the job. Continuing with the example of wood, one must consider the effects of each type of wood on the mood of the room. When selecting the best wood to use, particular attention needs to be paid to its grain patterns, texture and colour. In rooms where relaxation or deep thought is the aim, say bedrooms or the study, dark, strong-grained woods are the rule. Here, the grain ought to match the furniture for a feeling of homogeneity. In rooms where activity and motion are typical, the dining room or living room, 
Lighter, finer-grained lumber is more suitable. In such a setting, the wood grain might be useful in offering a contrast to the furniture. This leads to a feel of subconscious excitement in keeping with the room's function. In either case, though, consult a decorator. It is a decorator's job to know what materials to use to fit the function of the room. Though some things about putting together a room are subjective and based on one's individual taste, materials appropriate to a room's function are much more straightforward. A decorator takes the needs of the customer and uses a mathematical formula rather than subjective words. Since feelings vary from person to person, verbal descriptions of wood types tend to be ambiguous. You want the wood you select, not something approximate. And if you do decide to do it yourself, remember that all wood must be treated with preservatives to enhance its appearance and preserve its natural beauty. In the case of stone or quarry tile, as flat-cut flooring stone is properly called, a new set of considerations must be weighed up. Simple colour aside, the degree of reflection must be kept in mind. This is called the reflectance rate, which is expressed in a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0, depending on the amount of light it reflects. At one end of the scale is polished silver. At a rating of 1.0, this shiny surface reflects nearly all of the light directed at it. Numbers closer to zero describe materials that absorb more light. Moving down the scale a bit, we see the plastic that has been painted white has a rate of 0.8, which makes sense. We know that the color white reflects all other color, while black absorbs all color, and plastic itself is a relatively reflective material. Materials that are denser and darker have reflectance rates much closer to zero. The quarry tile I mentioned a while ago has a rate of 0.1. As you may know, quarry tile is generally dark brown and made from clay, so it is quite dense. Of course, there is considerable variation among types of quarry tile because of the hue or treatment of the clay during its creation. Does anyone have any guesses as to what material may have a rate of almost 0.0? .0? We can guess most of these materials are black in color, but plastic, wood, and even stone reflect some light. One material with a rate of almost 0.0, .0 is black velvet. The texture produces almost no shine at all. Carrera marble, despite its white hue, is actually lower in reflectivity than black onyx. In any case, the fact that tiles vary somewhat should not be forgotten. A highly reflective floor would not be suitable in a library. It would be indispensable in a ballroom should your home be large enough to feature one. Again, a rule of thumb is that light means lively. Since form and material follow function, one should only use the more reflective materials in rooms where the cultivation and expression of energy is important. Bear in mind too that most types of stone cost more than all but the rarest of wood. Of course, there is no reason why some rooms of a house should not feature wood floors or other stone tiles. You can even mix the two. A room with wood panels on the walls can have a beautiful stone floor. My bedroom has white birch walls and a light blue slate floor. The place looks like a Russian hunting lodge. Remember, though, go with what feels right for you. Good taste and the laws of interior design are the homeowner's servants, not his master. It's only beautiful when you decide it is. I mean, you're the one who lives there, not the decorator, right? Okay. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.